Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman. It's a privilege to be your host. Thanks for joining us today. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. And we do that by interviewing creation scientists. And we have a great one with us today, a great man of research and science. And his name is Michael Ord. Michael, welcome. Thank you. Now, today we're going to talk about the post-flood ice age. And ice ages are a problem for young Earth Christians, pretty much, because the general science world tells us that it takes thousands and thousands of years for an ice age, and there have been a lot of them. Am I summarizing that correctly? Oh, that, that's correct. Uh, there's actually a couple hundred challenges in the Earth sciences, like uh, they say coal takes millions of years, oil takes millions of years, et cetera, et cetera. And ice ages take hundreds of thousands to millions of years. So that's just uh, one, one challenge. Uh, so here's uh, But you like challenges. Yes, the Lord has led me to, to attempt or to answer challenges that they give us. That's right. So that's uh, what I've been doing for years. But so here's the challenge of, of, the, of the Ice Age. Okay. Uh, they say each Ice Age takes 100,000 years. The glacial phase is 90,000 of that, and the interglacial is 10,000. Now, we are in an interglacial right now called the Holocene. It's uh, been going about 10,000 years. And there's been about 50 regular repeating ice ages during the last past 2.6 million years. Now, about a, a more than a million years ago, they claim that ice ages repeated every 40,000 years. That's why the numbers uh, don't match there with 50 regularly repeating in 2.6 million years. So, you know, they say ice ages take millions of years. Now, you're not presenting this as fact. You're presenting no. this as what the other side is this saying. This is what they, they, yeah, they what the other side say. is saying. Yeah, that's right. Th this is the challenge that we give us. This is the challenge of the Ice Age. And here's a quote from Arthur Strahler. He's an anti-creationist. Uh, they decided that the, the Antarctic ice sheet uh, was 10 times as old. So he says this puts a lot more stress on us. And here's his quote from this anti-creationist book. Increasing the duration of the Ice Age by a factor of about 10 greatly increases the stress upon the creation scientist who must compress the events of 15 million years into 4,000 years of post-flood time. Uh, well, he got one thing right. It's in the post-flood time. But can we meet a challenge like this of 15 million years of time and 4,000 years of Earth history? Yes, I, th I think we can. So my theme verse for research, as you know, is examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good. I'm holding fast to the Bible's God's word, and Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but I'm examining the data carefully. See, when I examine data, I look at what's the real data and what's the interpretations. There's a difference. So I'm interested in what's observed, the actual factual data. Then I'm going to go with that. You got to do, and you got to go beyond the superficial level. That's why this, this verse emphasized carefully, because if, if you look at something at the superficial level, you're just going to know enough to get in trouble. <laughs> so you got to go in depth, and this is what I've done. Okay. Well, go up to the board if you would, sir, and show us the evidence. I think you've laid out yourself quite a challenge, and I'm anxious to hear your solution. Okay. I'm going to present this as a number of questions. The first question, was there really an ice age? Well, let's take a look at the, the data out there in the field. To examine uh, what an, an ice age does, you go to places that were previously glaciated and have uh, been receding. Practically all the glaciers in the world have been receding, so as they recede, we see what they left. And we, then we go check other places and see if those same features are there. So when you examine this, you not only find those moraines, you find scratched bedrock like this. These, they called striated uh, bedrock. And that's because the glacier picks up boulders, and the boulders are moving over the bedrock, scratching the bedrock, but also scratching the boulder at the bottom of the ice, you see. So this is uh, what you f f they call striated bedrock. And when you go and look and see if you have these same features in areas that are glaciate, uh, said to be glaciated, you look for these. Well, this is west of Great Falls, Montana, uh, where I used to live for many years. And right out in this area is the Rocky Mountain Front. Uh, and right here, you see a, a mound right in here, and it actually came back over on this side, and this is a subdued moraine for when the ice was in the, the Rocky Mountains. It came out about 10 miles out into the high plains and formed this, this mound of debris, a moraine 
that is similar to what you see today uh, when, when glaciers recede. It broke right in here, uh, probably because of it dammed up a lake and it probably broke through there and eroded. And then when we go up to into the Rocky Mountain front, uh, to the first cliff about 800 feet high, uh, we find scratch bedrock, like right in here, going right up over the cliff. And that's, those are the scratches left uh, from the ice. And this is an area where the temperature gets up to uh, 85 degrees in the summertime. It's, it would be very hard for ice to be here at this time. I mean, you'd have to cool it way down. So, but it's evidence that not long, long ago there was ice because you still see the strided uh, pavements. So you're telling us that the two um, things that you showed us from the current glacier, those characteristics are there in the Rocky Mountains, so there was an ice age there. Yes, there was ice here. Yes. And then when you go to many mountainous areas in the west, you find these, uh, uh, out from a, a mountain valley, you find these horseshoe-shaped moraines. Uh, like around the Sierras, the Wind River Mountains. This is around the Wallawa Mountains uh, in northeast Oregon. Uh, out, it went, the glacier came out of this valley here and went out into the plain here near what's called Enterprise, Oregon. It's about 4,000 feet. And it left a very sharp lateral moraine there, a small end moraine there, and, a, and another um, lateral moraine there, a horseshoe-shaped moraine that's over deep and, and a lake fills it. When you add it all up, this is where it was glaciated not that long ago. Much of the northern United States, the mountains of the, of the western United States. Uh, this is just a schematic. It's not meant to be accurate. It's just a generalized. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the, the Brooks Range of Alaska was uh, glaciated. And uh, right up in here. Uh-huh and the Alaska Range was glaciated, but the lowlands were not. A major mystery of Earth science because that's a great area for them to be glaciated. Why weren't they glaciated? But virtually or nearly virtually all of Canada was under a glacier. Virtually. And most of all New England of the United States. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and parts of Northwest Canada right there were not glaciated. Right. There was an ice age. Not that long ago, because the striations are still fairly fresh, the moraines are still fairly sharp. Secondly, can mainstream sciences explain the Ice Age? See, they're always challenging us, as that quote I gave you. Uh, but when I, when I check a challenge, uh, I find out that there's, when they point one finger at us, there's three fingers pointing at them. It's a challenge also to them. Yes. And, and it is a challenge. But before we can uh, understand the challenge, then we got to find out or understand what causes an ice age. There's, there's three main requirements. Uh, cooler summers. We see winters are cool enough already. So you got to cool the summers and, of course, late springs and early falls. I mean, the warm season's got to be cooler. So you need cooler summers. You need greater snowfall because even if you did cause a cooler climate, you, you dry out the air. Those are the two main mechanisms. But... If you find a, a, a climate change to do this, it can't just be for one year. It's got to be year after year so the snow builds up. So it's got to persist for many years. Yeah. That's the requirements for an ice age. So how much cooler are we talking about? Well, let's kind of find out what, what it, how cool it has to be around the periphery of the ice sheet, like Minneapolis, the city of Minneapolis. The, the ice sheet was probably around 500 feet thick there. Not too thick there, but uh, still 500 feet. <laughs> That's well, the average temperature of Minneapolis, June to August, uh, you know, that includes the maximum and the minimums. This is the average of 70 degrees. To get ice there, at least you've got to go down to 32. But because solar radiation is the main mechanism of melting snow, you have to go well below 32 degrees. How far below? Well, I went to studies of, on the coastal Antarctica and found out you get net melting when the temperature warms up to 14 degrees in the spring. So you'd have to cool it off to about 14 degrees for a summer average in Minneapolis for the snow to stay from the winter through the summer. But to be conservative, I said, let's make it just 20 degrees, round it off. So that from 70 to 20 degrees, that represents a drop of 50 degrees Fahrenheit along the edge of the ice. Okay, that's to be 50 degrees colder than the average summer. 
Yeah. Okay. So that, that's a pretty tall order for climate. They talk about climate change nowadays. Yeah. How are they going to get this from present processes? J.K. Charlesworth in the, in the book Quaternary Era, he says Pleistocene. By the way, Pleistocene is another name for the Ice Age. That's okay. uh, jargon for the Ice Age. Pleistocene phenomenon have produced an absolute riot of theories ranging from the great to the greatest, no, from the remotely possible to the mutually contradictory and the palpably inadequate. <laughs> Not, not a good option in there. <laughs> That's not saying much. Oh, but this is 1957, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, surely we know more now. Well, let's get some more quotes. David Alt said in the book Glacial Lake Missoula and its humongous floods, 2001, although theories abound, no one really knows what causes ice ages. Yeah. So they really don't know the cause of an ice age. Can the biblical worldview explain the ice age? Can we explain it? Well... The first thing we have to figure out is where do we place it in our worldview, in our time scale. As I showed you, the striations are fresh. They're on flood rocks, by the way. You have nice uh, ridged moraines, which you can't form in the flood, and they're on top of fl uh, flood sediments. So it's obviously that it's after the flood. So it's in a transitional climate from the end of the flood to the present climate. Right in here. So it's right after the flood as a transitional climate, that's where we replace it. So that opens up the possibility that maybe the flood caused the perturbation in the climate to cause the ice age. Maybe the flood is the key to the ice age. Indeed, that is. How? Well, here's how the Genesis flood fulfills the requirements. Uh, the flood was a gigantic volcanic uh, tectonic event. Uh, so after the flood, you, you're going to have lots of, of um, dust and, and aerosols up in the stratosphere uh, after the flood. I got to ask you, because our viewers are going to want to know, okay. it, when I think of flood, I think of water. Uh, what does that have to do with volcanoes? Well, to cause the flood, you had the whole earth perturbed. You had, and you had parts of the earth going up and down. You had meteorite impacts. Uh, and, and this is going to cause a lot of volcanism of all scales. So it scales. isn't just rain. There's a whole shaking of the earth. And yeah, that the fountains of the great deep vicons. burst forth. Yes, thank you. That's what I wanted to hear you say. Yes, and that implies uh, volcanism, earth movements. Mountains uh, coming up, valleys going down, yes. and volcanoes. The yeah, whole lots thing of is yeah. shaking. Yeah. Anytime you have the, the, the crust move earth, you're going to tap the deep rock. Right. And the deep right. ro rock is sometimes molten, so right. it's going to come up. Okay. So you have a lot of volcanism during the flood. But after the flood, you have a lot of volcanic dust and aerosols trapped in the stratosphere. And sunlight will bounce off and be reflected to space on this. Some of it's sunlight. Most of it will come down, but some will be reflected. And this will end up cooling the mid and high latitude continents. So you're saying that the, that the flood caused global cooling? It'll cause global cooling, yes. Yes, okay. Yes, that's a good way to put it. All right. Then what about the moisture? Ah, but the fountains of the great deep are, are it, it's, kind of, it's a little bit difficult understanding what that is, but if they're water coming from down in the crust, it'd be hot water coming up and added to the ocean. Also, we had a lot of volcanism during the flood, and that would heat up the water. So the upshot of all this, you're going to have a warm ocean after the flood from top to bottom and pole to pole. And the significance of this, the warmer the water, the more the, the evaporation. So, and, and the water will be the warmest compared to today at mid and high latitudes. For instance, it might be 80 degrees Fahrenheit in the Arctic Ocean. No sea ice. And you, uh, 80 degrees in North Pacific, North Atlantic. And that's much warmer than today. And so the warmer the water, the, the evaporation you have. And, this, and since it's at mid-latitude, this is the main effect. You have all that mid-latitude evaporation to to get caught in storms and land right on the mid-latitude and high-latitude continents right nearby uh, to cause a rapid ice age. And the mechanism is going to persist, but it will wane with time. And here's kind of how it works right here. You're, you're, this is at mid and high latitudes, the warm ocean, a lot more evaporation uh, f uh, from that. and. You have uh, volcanic dust in, in the upper atmosphere, lots of clouds form, and falling as snow and ice and building up ice sheets. So that's just generally a, uh, a quick snapshot of how you form a rapid ice age.
Michael, you've given us a great mechanism to understand how the Ice Age happened, but uh, we start out with slides that talk about how many hundreds of thousands of years they would take. What about time frame? Yeah, that's a very important uh, point. Uh, that's my next question is, how rapid was the Ice Age? Yes. Well, the way to do that is I ran calculations on the cooling of the ocean. Uh, you add up all the, the factors that cause warming, which would be the solar radiation, all the factors that cause cooling, which mostly would be evaporation, and they get a change in temperature, change in time. As the oceans cool enough, it, the, uh, the ice builds up on land, reaches a max, and then it starts melting, you see. So it depends on the temperature of the ocean, the cooling of the ocean. But there's no way to be accurate with these, so the variables, they use maximums and minimums so that I can bracket the time. And when I did this, I got a minimum of 297 uh, years and a maximum of 1,765 years. But the best estimate was about 500 years to cool the ocean off to 10 degrees centigrade. So the, the uh, glaciation, the, the ice age would reach a maximum in about 500 years. And, and here's some of the average depths I got. And also based on, uh, on maximum minimums and the variables. You can see the range for the northern hemisphere in Antarctica. The best range is about 2,330 feet. On the average, there are some places that are a lot thinner and some places a lot thicker, you see. The average for Antarctica is about 3,925 feet. That's at glacial maximum. Then you have to melt all this, except for Antarctica and Greenland. And to do that, I use the best equation you can. It's the, it's the energy balance over snow and ice cover. And it's the same thing. I use maximum minimums for the variables, because there was a, a phenomenon that heat the ice and that that cools it. And when you heat it up to about thir to 32, then it's melt from then on. So using maximum minimums to, to melt the periphery. Now, the periphery is a 400 mile strip along the edge of the ice sheet. So to melt that edge, it took a, the range was 40 to 100 years. The best estimate was 70 years. But interior Canada, interior Scandinavia, uh, it took longer. They get less solar radiation, they're cooler. So it took about 200 years. So the total time for the ice age was only 700 years. We don't need 100,000 years for one ice age. Wow, that's a big difference. And, and you seem to have data to support yours, where the other one is just speculation, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. There's, there's even uh, other questions. Uh, uh, how many ice ages were there? This is just for one. Do we, were there many, many ice ages that we need to do? Well, uh, I found out that the multiple ice age was mainly an assumption. In fact, here's an article from the journal called Geology. Uh, it's by six researchers for the from the University of Edmonton in Alberta. They said, a single late Wisconsin Laurentide glaciation, Edmonton area in southwest Alberta. Translating that, they only believe in one ice age. It was late Wisconsin time, and it was the big ice sheet that was in central and eastern Canada and the northern, adjacent northern United States. And there's only one of them in, in, in southwest Alberta, clear up to Edmonton. Notice what they say in this quote here. Glacial reconstructions commonly assume a multiple glaciation hypothesis in all areas attain a till cover. Till is glacial debris. So when they look at glacial debris, they commonly assume multiple glaciation. Most areas, you only see one till, one glaciation. It's only on the edge where it, it's been oscillating that you find multiple till layers was separated by sand or something that they, you know, they claim there's multiple glaciation. So the upshot of this is it's, it's mainly an assumption. The evidence really supports only one ice age. Then the last question, will there be another ice age? See, we haven't uh, ended the glacial, interglacial cycle yet. We're still in it. So they believe the next ice age is coming. In fact, we had some global cooling from 1945 to 1975. And there's books written that the next ice age is coming. <laughs> so will Before there be? we worried about global warming, we were worried about global cooling. Yes, that's, that's true. <laughs> well, well here, how, here's how they get this. We are still in the glacial, interglacial cycle, as I say. Interglacials last 10,000 years, and according to their, their time scales, it's been 10,000 years since it melted, so we're due any day now. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, in the New York Times, Daniel Grossman said, if the past is any indication, the Earth is at the end of another such warm period, poised to descend into a new ice age. So they think we're ready. This is in 2003 in the New York Times. And this isn't based on any science. It's just based on assumption of 
how often yeah, they happen. Yeah, the cycles like this, yeah. and so we're about ready for the Ice Age cycle. I wouldn't hold my breath. No, I wouldn't either. In fact, because of the rainbow, we can uh, rest easy. There'll never be another Ice Age because there'll never be the, another flood. Never be another flood. <laughs> Therefore, there'll be another, never be another Ice Age. And without the flood, there really isn't a mechanism to cause it, is there? That's right. Yes. All right, well, that's awesome. Give us your summary. Okay. The Ice Age was a real event not that long ago. It's a major mystery for evolutionary Earth science. Noah's flood caused a transitional climate for the Ice Age. The Ice Age lasted only 700 years. Don't need 100,000 years for an Ice Age. There was only one Ice Age. Only the Bible explains the Ice Age because of the flood. When we bring the flood back into Earth history, we solve those multiple time challenges that they give us. And this is just one example. And there will be no future Ice Age. Here, let, me, let me ask you, just ask you this. Um, how long after, you, when you do your drawing of, of the uh, flood and, and the 40 days and then the 150 days and then the, the runoff, uh, the different stages of the runoff, that whole thing is just about a year. Yes, right. A little okay. more than a year. So how long after that year do we really have the Ice Age impacting the Earth? Right, right away. Like the next year? Or you, oh, so yeah. It starts. In, 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 in appropriate places. See, the warm water is going to hold it up right. in some areas. Like you're going to have onshore flow. Like, like Britain and those areas would be bathed in warm onshore flow for right. a number of years. So the Ice Age won't be there for a while. It's got to wait till midway, I think. But in appropriate areas like in interior north, uh, northeast U.S., and the mountains of Scandinavia, it'll start right, right away and then uh, go from there and just spread. So people who are looking for something to keep them awake at night to worry about, they can take ice ages off the list of things That's to worry exactly about. That's exactly right. <laughs> and again, uh, I, uh, a couple great takeaways. It doesn't take 100,000 years for an ice age. It takes about 700 years. Mm -hmm. We have, those of us who believe in a young earth and believe in a, a global flood, we have a very good explanation for the one and only ice age. Yes. And the other side really has no explanation for the multiple ice ages they talk about. No, they have 60 theories. One that's kind of popular right now, but it has a lots of problems called the astronomical theory of the ice age. Okay. Uh, what great work you've done for us. And again, I'm so thankful. And, and you know, parents, it, get your kids to watch this show. Get them to see that the Bible gives us good answers for the reality of the history of the world and for the earth that we live on. And help them to come to believe that the Bible tells us God's truth about our world. And then when we can believe the Bible about the formation of the world and what's happened on it, we can believe the plan of salvation that's out of the same book. And so I just want to emphasize to you, especially you parents out there, never be afraid to search for truth. Because when we find the truth, it'll lead us back to Jesus who is the ultimate truth. And so I just want to remind you before we go one more time that the God who caused the ice age by causing the flood, it's his view that he created you. And that should be your worldview too. I hope you'll join me again soon here on Origins. And until then, God bless you, my friend. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 1307, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.